So good morning to all of you. Today, as you can see, Waldemar still isn't back. He has one more day in the U.S. before he flies back, and he's actually preaching today in the U.S., in our home church. So um, let's pray together. I hope that you have sat in the presence of the Lord this morning. We're talking about divine healing and divine provision. And that comes from being in the presence of Jesus. So let's just pray together. Lord, we just thank you that you are so good to us in ways that we don't even think about or know. You are good to us. You are faithful. We sing our songs and our hymns of love to you because of your faithfulness. And we thank you, dear Lord. So we ask that you be present with us as your scriptures are read. We be, pre be present with us in communion. Be present with us in the praise that we pray, prayers that we pray over each other, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, divine healing. Okay, children. If you want to go with Miss Laura, that'd be great. And honey, do you have the kids or do you have them in the hall today? You have taking the kids? You have, yeah, kids, you can go with honey. Or with mom, as the case may be. <laughs> All right. You know, there's some sensational stories of healing in the Bible, aren't there? Right? Like leopard cleansed. People raised from the dead. Sensational. And we hear stories today. And then we get sick and we're disappointed. We go like, isn't God the same today? All right, what about when someone like Dr. Hannah dies, when we've all been praying for her? Is God not responsive to our prayers? And yet the scripture also says all our days are written in his book. Not one of them is shortened. So you're not going to die until the days written for you are over. All right? Because creation has fallen, you will experience hardship. So I'm going to tell you two stories, and both from our family to start with. The first one is that our family came from Winnipeg. Have any of you ever been to Winnipeg? Any of you ever been to Siberia? <laughs> okay, the temperature is pretty close to the same. Okay, minus 40 in the winter. It is so cold. We always laugh. We say, Winnipeg is like two months in the room, three months in the refrigerator, Six months in the freezer, maybe eight. A little bit of time, a month or two in the refrigerator, and then you come out for two normal months, and then it's over. <laughs> well, what that does, you know, the leaching, when, when you're on moss, and the moss is wet on concrete, you know how slippery that is? That's what ice is like when you're walking on it. My grandma was a widow, her sister was a widow, she's walking up to her house, and she hit a patch of ice, and she fell. And she broke her arm. And I, when I asked her, I said, Grandma, how do you know your arm was breaking? She said, well, you could see the bone sticking out. Of course it was broken. And so her sister, she called her sister. Her sister came over, didn't live far away. She said, now let's go to the doctor. And my grandma said, you know what? I've heard from God. I'm not going to the doctor. Jesus is going to heal me. And Auntie Lisa said, Katarina, let's go to the doctor. She said, no, Jesus said he's going to heal me. I believe he's my healer. So she said, okay, then let's wrap your arm up, you stubborn sister, you. They wrapped her arm up in a kitchen towel. They wrapped it around so that it didn't, you know, so tied it around her head so that she had a bit of a sling. And she went to sleep. And she said, Jesus, if you're my healer, heal me. And she woke up. There was nothing wrong with her arm. Completely, utterly healed. There was no after effect, nothing. Okay? So this is the backdrop of our family story. Grandma experienced many miracles. And she told us about them. God heals. Okay, we know that. All right? Then our daughter gets sick. She's 15. Her knees are swollen. I mean, it's like you have a, a football. They're so big. I, I get up in the morning and go like, I can't believe your knees are so... She'd go like, I know, Mom, right? Her wrist just swollen, bigger than 
shoulder. Huge. And we went to the doctors, and finally, about the third or fourth doctor, they said she has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And Waldemar and I are like, good, now we know what it is, now we can treat it. And God will heal it, right? So we decided to try some natural medicines first. When we went to Children's Hospital, they said, we're going to give her this and this and this, and these are the side effects. And the side effects were horrendous. And so we went back home and we prayed. And we talked to some medical professionals who were Christian. They said, don't do that. That'll harm her liver, it'll harm her heart, it'll harm her whole body. So we went like, okay, then what? And we found a doctor who was a naturopathic and a physical doctor. And she went there for a year and a half. And then she got worse and worse. Every time we went, he says, oh, you're getting better. Oh, you're getting better. And we look at her and go, like, she is not getting better. And then we pray, God, give us wisdom. Heal our daughter. And a nurse or a doctor would come up and go, like, do not take those heavy medicines. They will poison her system. So we go, like, okay. We pray, we heard from the Lord. And in a year and a half, when she could walk, she was mostly lame, she could hardly walk anymore. You could hear her bones grating. Her hips had gone. Her hip had gone. And so we took her to Children's, and the doctor said, what is the matter? Don't you love your daughter? Why did you wait so long? And we said, we prayed, we fasted, we said, God, we believe you can heal. And now we're here. And they said, okay, we're going to put her on these medicines, and we have to replace her hip. And, you know, I'm thinking, all right, Grandma went to sleep, her, her arm was fixed. The doctor's going to come out, and he's going to say, I don't know what God has done. It's a miracle. Her hip is just like you. Right? We're sitting, praying over the surgery, praying over the surgeon, praying over the team. And the surgeon comes out, and I'm waiting for this good news. You know what he says? It was a great surgery. Everything went as well as we could expect. And I was so angry. I was so angry. I was angry for two years. I said, God, this is your daughter. I am a manager while she is a child in a team. Where are you? You, the God who killed my grandfather. Where are you? Do you remember praying prayers like that? Have you ever prayed prayers like that? What about all the prayers we've prayed? You know what? She said both hips were placed, both knees were placed, her ankles are fused. Now it's come to her elbows and her wrists. Now we say, God, you can heal. You absolutely can heal. We are confident in this. So where's our healing God when we are not healed? All right, two stories. One, divine intervention. The second one, working with medicine to sustain life. So Kirsten still struggles as an adult. So people said to us, do you have faith? <clears throat> i got to say yes, I do. When Waldemar and I pray for her, we say, God, you could touch her tonight when she goes to bed in the morning. All those replacements could be gone. It could be miraculous. Do what you want to do. We gave these children to you as children. We're not taking them back. It's up to you. You're their father. Was there sin in our life? Oh, do you know how many things we repented of? And just went like, if there's anything, oh God, Forgive us. It wasn't because there was sin in our life. People said, is there a lack? Not as far as we knew. You know, I have a, I had a nephew. He's since passed away, but he had spina bifida. And every day, all of us thank God for his, for his health, as such as it was, and for the health of our children. God did not make our daughter sick because we weren't thankful that she was healthy. That was not the lesson he was teaching us. So we say, God, is this to your glory? 
And all the more, and I say, we hope so. We hope this is for your glory because we don't understand it. You know, at the end of two years, the Lord said to me, all right, you're acting like you did when you were a teenager. Sudden blitz of anger, angry. Can you get over this? I'm still the same God you loved as a child. I'm the God you loved as a teenager. I'm the God you loved when your children were born. I'm still that one. Can you love me again? And I said, well, I've loved you all along, but I'm really angry. And he said, okay, get over it. Grow out of the stage. And, you know, I was so hurt when she was first sick, that sick, that I could not pray. I bought Quaker prayers, the Valley of Vision. I prayed those. I got on my knees, and I just read my prayers. I had nothing to say to God. I read the Orthodox prayers. I read the Catholic prayers, although I skipped the prayers of the saints and to Mary. But I just, I just had to pray, but I had no words. And for some of you, whether it's health or finances or relationships, you have been there when you can't pray, when life is so hard. And I'm here to tell you on the other side, God is the same God. He has not changed. You know, in the stories of Scripture, we hear of miraculous healing and miraculous provision, and often those come together. And I want to ask you, do you say thank you to God when life is normal, when you have food and shelter, when your relationships are healthy? Are you thankful? Sometimes the most miraculous thing is that no miracle is needed. That life is good. And when life is hard, are you thankful for the things that are working? I think it was Bill Bright who worked with the leper colony. And he was a medical doctor. And somebody said to him, Dr. Bright, how can you stand to go among people whose hands have fallen off, whose noses are gone, whose ears are gone. He said, you know, I go in and I go like, wow, God, this is so wonderful. Look how much is working. He said, I'm astonished at how God has put in us so many things that are working. And in light of that, we are going to read two stories from the Old Testament. They happen within a generation of each other. And most of what I'm going to say today is the reading of Scripture. Okay? Because we believe this living word speaks to us. And sometimes we read the stories like fairy tales. There once was a woman, you know, once upon a time, and they lived happily ever after. When I read the story, I want you to read it as though it's you in the story. I'm going to read the widow of Zarephath first. Put yourself either in Elijah's place or in the widow's place. And imagine this story is happening to you. Because it happened to real people. Do you remember the name Jezebel? Okay. It's associated with perversion, prostitution, and sexual sins. Right? If you say you're a Jezebel, it's not a compliment. Because what happens in this time of Elijah is there's a queen who is from the Sidonians. She marries King Ahab of Israel. And Israel is wicked. They serve idols. They worship idols. There are all kinds of sins and perversions going on. And that's the backdrop for this first story. The prophet Elijah said to the evil King Ahab, I serve the Lord. He is, and this is the first uh, series of um, the slides for the scriptures, okay? I serve the Lord. He is the God of Israel. You can be sure that he lives. And you can be just as sure that there won't be any dew or rain on the whole land during the next few years. It won't come unless, I, until I say so. Then a message came to Elijah from the Lord. He said, leave this place. Go east and hide in the Carrot Valley. You will drink water from the brook. I've directed some ravens to supply you with food there. So Elijah did what the Lord had told him to do. The ravens brought him meat or bread and meat in the morning. They also brought him bread and meat in the evening. He drank water from the brook. And this sounds like a great story, but do you know the kind of stuff that ravens drag around? 
Every time I read this, I think, ew, but he stayed alive. Okay, maybe God gave him fresh bread and fresh meat, I don't know. But sometime later, the brook dried up. A message came to Elijah from the Lord. He said, go right away to Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Who is from Sidon? Remember? Jezebel. He's gone to her home country, to people who worship like she worships. Stay there, God said. I directed a widow there to supply you with food. So Elijah went to Zarephath. He came to the town gate. A widow was there gathering sticks. He called out to her. He asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar? I need a drink. Remember, water is very scarce. She went to get the water. Then he called out to her, please bring me a little piece of bread, too. I don't have any bread, she replied, and that's just as sure as the Lord your God is alive. All I have is a small amount of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home. I'll make one last meal for myself and my son. We'll eat it. After that, we'll die. Think of the little kids who went with Laurel to Sunday school, being on the verge of starvation. And somebody asked their mom to make the last meal for them. That's what we have here. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home. Do what you said, but first make me a small loaf of bread. Make it out of what you have and bring it to me. Then make some for yourself and your son. The Lord is the God of Israel. He says the jar of flour will not be used up. The jug will always have oil in it. You will have flour and oil until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Now, this lady has a choice. She has a choice. And what does she do? She went away and did what Elijah had told her to do. So Elijah had food every day. There was also food for the woman and her family. The jar of flour wasn't used up. The jug always had oil in it. We call this a miracle of provision. Sometimes God will provide for you in ways that are so miraculous you don't know where the money came from, don't know where the food came from. My brother moved to Switzerland. He had nothing, no work. He just had the word of the Lord move there. And one day, he said to his wife, what are we having for lunch? She said, I have no idea. There's nothing in the cabinet. He said, okay. He went into his prayer room, and there's a knock at the door at noon, and somebody had bought the groceries. So sometimes you receive this miraculous provision. Sometimes you are the miracle that God sends to someone. Sometime later, so all is well, right? Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became sick and got worse. And worse, finally, he stopped breathing. The woman said to Elijah, you are a man of God. What do you have against me? Did you come to bring my sin out into the open? We don't know what our sin is. Did you come to kill my son? <clears throat> Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms. He carried him to the upper, upstairs room where he was stay, staying. He put him down on the bed. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord. Elijah knows where to go. He said, Lord, my God, I'm staying with this widow. Have you brought pain and sorrow even to her? Have you caused her son to die? Then he lay down on the boy three times. He cried out to the Lord. He said, Lord, my God, give this boy's life back to him. The Lord answered Elijah's prayer. He gave the boy's life back to him, so the boy lived. Elijah picked up the boy, carried him down from the upstairs room into the house, and he gave him to his mother. He said, look, your son is alive. All right, right here. Do you think this woman already knows God is God? What has she been? What what has been her food? Miraculous provision every single day, right? But watch what happens. Then the woman said to Elijah, "Now I know that 
you are a man of God. I know that the message you brought from the Lord is true. I have some questions for you from the story. Does God target people to harm them? Does he pick out someone and go like, I'm going to make this one sick. I'm going to take away this one's money. Does God do that? How many of you think he does that? Since creation began, the world under Satan's rule is sick and evil. And if nothing has happened to you, it's been God's protection. It's not that God is out to get you, but you do have an enemy who is out to get you, who will harm you if you can. Now, did God instantly heal the boy? You remember in the story? Was it an instantaneous healing? No. Elijah had to stretch himself up three times and, and just appeal to God. It took a while, and Elijah didn't give up. What was the result? The boy's back to life. The boy's back to life. and God grew, his appreciation for what God could do. Sometimes we walk right past when God does something. But we, re we read that Elijah did seven miracles, and the next person, his protege, or the one that he mentored, was Elisha. And we're going to have Maki come up and read the story of Elisha, our second story. And remember this, does God target people to harm them? How do the people respond, and what is the result? Reading from the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 5, Nehemiah was army commander of the king of Aram. He was very important to his master and was highly respected. That's because the Lord had helped him win the battle over Aram's enemies. He was a brave soldier, but he had a skin disease. Groups of soldiers from Aram had marched out. They had captured a young girl from Israel. She became a servant of Naaman's wife. The young girl spoke to the woman she was serving. She said, I wish my master would go and see the prophet who is in Samaria. He would heal my master of his skin disease. Naaman went to see his own master. He told him what the girl from Israel had said. I think you should go, the king of Aram replied. I'll give you a letter to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman left. He carried the letter to the king of Israel. It said, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you with this letter. I want you to heal him of his skin disease. The king of Israel read the letter. As soon as he did, he tore his royal, royal robes. He said, oh my God, can I kill people and bring them back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be healed of his skin disease? He must be trying to pick a fight with me. Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes. So he sent the king a message. Elisha said, Why have you torn your robes? Tell the man to come to me. Then he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went to see Elisha. He took his horses and chariots with him. He stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger out to him. 
The messenger said, Go, wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times. Then your skin will be healed. You will be pure and clean again. But Naaman went away angry. He said, I was sure Elisha would come out to me. I thought he would stand there and pray to the Lord his God. I thought he would wave his hand over my skin, then I would be healed. And what about the Abana and Farfar rivers of Damascus? Aren't they better than all the rivers of Israel? Couldn't I wash in the rivers of Damascus and be made pure and clean? So he turned and went away. He was very angry. Naaman's servants went over to him. They said, You are like a father to us. What if Elisha the prophet had told you to do some great thing? Wouldn't you have done it? But he only said, Wash yourself, then you will be pure and clean. You should be even more willing to do that. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River. He dipped himself in it seven times. He did exactly what the man of God had told him to do. Then his skin was made pure again. It became clean like the skin of a young boy. Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. Naaman stood in front of Elisha. Naaman said, now I know that there is no God anywhere in the whole world except in Israel. So please accept a gift, a gift from me. The prophet answered, I serve the Lord. You can be sure that he lives. And you can be just as sure that I won't accept a gift from him. Even though Naaman begged him to take it, Elisha wouldn't. I can see that you won't accept a gift from me, said Naaman. But please let me have some soil from your land. Give me as much as a pair of mules can carry. Here's what I want. Here's why I want it. I won't ever bring burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god again. I'll bring them only to the Lord. I'll worship him on his own soil. But there is one thing I hope the Lord will forgive me for. From time to time, my master will enter the temple to bow down to his god rival. When he does, he'll leave on my arm. Then I'll have to bow down there also. I hope the Lord will forgive me for that. Go in peace, Elisha said. All right, do you think God picked Naaman to harm him? I want to tell you, creation is broken. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we've seen sickness comes to the young and the old. It comes to the rich. It comes to the poor. Poverty comes to the whole, in the whole world, okay? If you're suffering something, I want to tell you it's not because God said, I don't like Rosemary, I'm going to make her sick. I don't like Kristen, she's going to suffer. That's not what our God is like. But creation is broken. So, Illness happens, but how did people respond? What about that little girl? Now remember, she's a slave. Somebody has captured her, taken away her away from her family. Imagine, we don't know how old she is. Do you guys know any 10-year-olds? Anybody like between the age of 8 and 12? Any little girls? Imagine if there's a raid on the village and that child is taken away and she's made a slave. What is her response when she hears that her, her master is sick and nothing can help him? What does she say? The God of Israel is not like your gods. 
She remembers what she's been taught as a child, that God heals. The foreign king really likes this commander. What does he say? <coughs> Go try it. All right, I'll send you a letter of recommendation. So then what does Israel's king say? Oh, they're coming to pick a fight. They want to have war with us. Right? Fear. And sometimes around various parts, when you're not provided for, you feel you're not provided for, or you're sick, fear is a response, whether it's in you or around you. All right? How about the prophet? What does Elisha say? Send him to me. I'm going to do whatever God says. Right? <laughs> and Naaman, how does he respond to what the prophet hears from God? What was Naaman expecting? Sometimes what we expect the healing service. In the name of God, you be healed. Ah, you know all this stuff, right? I've been there. I've even been healed at some of those services. I have to be honest. Sometimes we have an expectation. What is, how is God going to touch us? How is he going to provide for us? How will we heal? I expected a miraculous touch for my daughter. What we got was doctors and enough money to pay for medicine. That also is a miracle. Right? You can't say to God, I need this, do it this way. Sometimes, just like for Naaman, your obedience will be very small. He goes like, what's the big deal with this river? We have better river. And, the, and his servants say, look, if he asked you for something big, he would have done it. Let's just give it a try. <clears throat> and the prophet says, no matter how weird it is, I'm going to do what God tells me. And pass that along. So the result of the game is what? In Naaman's, Naaman's heart. What happens to Naaman? He's healed. And who does he worship? He worships God. Alright? Okay, when sin entered the world, creation began to decay. Do you remember people used to live almost a thousand years? Then they lived hundreds of years. And now, if somebody reaches 80 or 90, you go like, wow, old person. Really old person. When they're as old as I am, they're already like, wow, old person. But if I get to be 85, 90, people go like, oh, she's really old. Why? Because kid creation has continued to decay. There are more cancers, more birth defects, more things going wrong than ever. Animals used to live in harmony, right? Now you put a rabbit into the lion's den, and what happens? No more rabbit. Okay. Those animals, those creatures used to live in harmony. And we're told when God restores the earth, the lion and the lamb will lay down together. So there is a day coming when everything is restored. But meanwhile, God has made roots and leaves and stems. He's given us medicines that truly are miraculous when you go back even 100 years. Don't forget to appreciate what he's giving you, the kinds of healings that he gives. Okay, we're going to read two New Testament stories, and both of them have to do with Peter. The first one, we're going to have Judah read from Acts 3, and then we're going to have Marina read from Acts 9. Reading from the book of Acts, chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple. 
It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was the time for prayer. A man, unable to walk, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. He had been that way since he was born. Every day, someone put him near the gate. There, he would beg for people going to the temple courtyards. He saw that Peter and John were about to enter. So he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, and so did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man watched them closely. He expected to get something from them. Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold, but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then Peter took him by the right hand and held him up. At once, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. He went with Peter and John into the temple courtyards. He walked and jumped and praised God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the man, as the same man who used to sit and beg at the temple gate called Beautiful. They were filled with wonder. They were amazed at what had happened to him. The man was holding on to Peter and John. All the people were amazed. They came running to them at the place called Solomon's Porch. When Peter saw this, he said, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? It's not as if we've made this man walk by our own power or godliness. The God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has done this. God has brought glory to Jesus, who serves him. But you handed Jesus over to be killed. Pilate had decided to let him go, but you spoke against Jesus when he was in Pilate's court. You spoke against the holy and blameless one. You asked for a murderer to be set free instead. You killed the one who gives life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. This man, whom you see and know, was made strong because of faith in Jesus' name. Faith in Jesus has healed him completely. You can see it with your own eyes. My fellow Israelites, I know you didn't realize what you were doing. Neither did your leaders, but God had but God had given a promise through all the prophets, and this is how he has made his promise come true. He said that his Messiah would suffer. So turn away from your sins. Turn to God. Then your sins will be wiped away. The time will come when the Lord will make everything new. He will send the Messiah. Jesus has been appointed as the Messiah for you. Heaven must receive him until the time when God makes everything new. He promised this long ago through his holy prophets. What the prophets said was meant for you. The covenant God made with your people long ago is yours also. He said to Abraham, All nations of earth will be blessed through your children. God raised up Jesus who serves him. God sent him first to you. He did it to bless you. He wanted to turn each of you from your evil ways. From Acts 9, Peter traveled around the country. He went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lida. There he found a disabled man named Aeneas. For eight years the man had spent most of his time in bed. And yes, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, roll up your mat. So Aeneas got up right away. Everyone who lived in Lida and Sharon saw him. They turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a believer named Tabitha. Her name in the Greek language is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping poor people. About that time that she became sick and bad. Her body was washed and placed in a room upstairs. Lida was near Joppa. The believers heard that Peter was in Lida, so they sent two men to him. 
They begged him, please come at once. Peter went with them. When he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying. They showed him the ropes and other clothes Dorcas had made before she died. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he went get then he got down on his knees and prayed. He turned toward the dead woman. She said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers, especially the widows. He brought her to them. They saw that she was alive. This became known all over Joppa. Many people believe in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. All right, we don't read that, that the man in the temple was looking to be healed. But Peter remembers Jesus heals, and he says, I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. I called uh, IES in Jakarta, and I asked them, do you have someone with the gift of healing right now? And they said, we don't. We pray over the sick. But we don't have someone in particular who does that. If they had, I would have asked him to come. Because you don't see that every single believer prayed for every single person who was sick. It doesn't mean that they didn't. It's just that the book of Acts doesn't say that. We don't know if Aeneas asked for healing. Okay, this first man was disabled since he was a baby. He had a birth defect. Something or somebody dropped him since birth, he's been sick. And Nias has had been disabled for eight years. And Dorcas is healthy until suddenly she's dead. Okay? We don't know if Peter just had pity on Aeneas, if God prompted him to pray for him. We don't, for Dorcas, the church sends for Peter. And Peter prays for her. And they ask God for healing with Peter. You know, we can ask God for the same. I don't want to discourage you from praying for the sick or praying for God to heal you. We can ask, but we cannot dictate how that happens. Remember when we talked about Acts 2, we said, we say, Spirit, come. We can't say to him, you must, and we can't say it to him, you may not. And it's the same for healing. Not every person who's prayed for is physically healed. Paul himself has times when he's physically ill. Do you remember he asks three times, God, please heal me? And God says, I have other plans for you. Stop asking about that. My grace is sufficient. So there is that. Does Paul ever pray for people to be healed? Yes. And then I ask, so, for this person who's first supposed to pray for Paul, God said, what I gave you is enough. Peter and Paul and the other apostles don't go looking for sick people. They're not sensationalists. They don't become famous healers who go on healing tours. You don't read that they scream at people or push them around. But when they hear from the Holy Spirit, they obey and people are healed. And I believe the Lord is the same today as he was then. Here's an instruction from the Apostle James. He says, this is how you live life together. Is anyone among you in trouble? Some of you are in trouble. That person should pray. Is anyone among you happy? Some of you guys are really happy. That person should sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? That person should, that person should send for the elders of the church to pray for them. They should ask the elders to anoint them with 
oil in the name of the Lord. Okay? And we're going to do that today. If you're physically sick, trust that the Lord is going to intervene for you. The prayer offered by those with faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will heal them if they have sinned. Some of you came in here with something on your conscience or a bad habit that's on your leg just like a, a chain. All right? If you've sinned, you will be forgiven. So confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Your spirit, your mind, your body, your emotions, you are all connected. You can't tell me that if you stub your toe that your emotions are not involved. <laughs> okay? If something happens to one part of you, all of you is affected. So the scripture says, pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a godly person is powerful and things happen because of it. So some of us go, are going like, yeah, but we're not really superhuman. Who are we to pray or to be prayed over? James goes on to say, Elijah was a human being just as we are. He prayed hard that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and it rained, and the earth produced its crops. Prayer is powerful. God is listening. He can do whatever he wants. But Jesus said, keep asking and ask in my name. So in the community of faith at IES Fundamental, we believe that whatever we need from God, God knows it. He rescues us in trouble. He accepts our thanks when we're happy. If we're ill or we need forgiveness, the elders pray for each other and we pray for each other. And we're going to do that today. We're going to ask God to help and to heal. And first, we're going to remember that Jesus gave us a way to remember him. Communion is about his broken body, broken for our healing, for every part of ourself. The spilled blood represents the sacrifice for our broken spirits and reconciles us to God. We're going to partake in that and remember the death and resurrection that bring us life today. I'm going to ask the LT and the ministry team who are here to get in line first because they're going to come to the side afterwards. They'll just be around the hall and they're going to take one of these if you need some physical healing or you want the Lord to heal you of something or you want to confess your sins and have you and be prayed over. Or maybe you're really happy and you want somebody to praise God with you. You're welcome to go to any of them, okay, and pray with them after you've gone through the communion line. So, why do we come? Paul says, I received from the Lord, but I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He didn't die for nothing. He died for us. Paul goes on, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. We're just going to pause. I'm going to ask Pop Chandra, maybe, and Shibley, if you guys would come up first and hold that. And we're just going to pause a little while before we start the communion line. When you have really talked to God and just cleared your heart before him, or maybe you've already done that and you just want to rejoice in God. But when you're ready, in a minute or two, come on up, okay? And if you need prayer, um, so if you're on the ministry team uh, or the LT, come on up and uh, we'll pray for people. Just so stand around the hall. And we'll pray for you. All right? Let's 
So, Lord Jesus, as we remember your body, as we remember your blood, we just say thank you. If there's anything in us that needs forgiving, forgive us, we pray. If there is anything, any choices that we need to make or unmake, we bring those to you. God, we give to you the sins of things we've done and the good things we've left on them. Because you are a healer, one who heals the spirit, mind, emotions, body, our will. It all belongs to you. Thank you for this body and this blood. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you need prayer for healing, or you're in trouble, come forward. If you want to thank God, come forward. And the elders of the ministry team will pray for you after.